I'm not up here because I think more highly of myself than I ought to think, but rather as a recovering politician, uh, I'm going to uh, speak from remarks and uh, uh, I'd like to see all of your shining faces. Uh, I want to thank the Committee for Responsible Foreign Policy for holding this briefing and for inviting me to speak on a subject that, as a Christian, I feel is vitally important and woefully underrepresented in the discussion of our Republic's foreign policy. It's become customary at events such as this for individuals to recall where they were and what they were doing on that beautiful and tragic morning of September 11, 2001. On that morning, about a dozen of my House colleagues and I were having breakfast with Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld in his personal dining room in the Pentagon. The Secretary had invited us to talk about floor consideration of the House's FY 2002 Defense Authorization Bill, which was scheduled to commence the following day. It was a bipartisan event, and not everyone was a member of the Armed Services Committee. The fellowship was a pleasant fellowship with an administration in its first year making a solid attempt at creating an atmosphere of bipartisan consensus building. Shortly after 9 a.m., a uniformed aide to the Secretary approached him, whispered in his ear, after which the Secretary concluded the breakfast and thanked us for attending. While several members loitered in the dining room to briefly and directly engage the busy secretary, some of us made our way down the stairs and out to the parking lot where we were to pick up our ride back to Capitol Hill. While we were waiting, Congressman John Micah from Florida received a telephone call from his staff. He relayed the message to us as he kept the cell phone to his ear. He said, a small plane or tourist helicopter has crashed into one of the World Trade Center towers in New York City. As it happened, Congressman Michael was a subcommittee chairman of the Transportation Committee, and he had held a field hearing at the Port Authority uh, in, during the August recess. Not long after he relayed the first message and the account of the field hearing, his countenance fell substantially. He then said, a second plane has struck the other tower. The three or four of us who had listened in on his conversation shared a common understanding. This was no accident. Our ride then arrived to take us back to our offices on Capitol Hill. It was the usual heavy morning traffic coming into D.C., and the minivan dropped us off at the Rayburn Horseshoe. A walk, I walked back to my office in the Longworth Building, and when I walked in the office, a member of my staff pointed to one of the small TVs in the waiting area and asked me, weren't you just there? When I turned to look at the TV, I saw the camera view of a huge black plume of smoke coming out of, the, out of the Pentagon. As it turned out, terrorists flew American Airlines Flight 77 into the side of that building approximately 13 minutes after our group departed the Pentagon parking lot. It would not be long after Americans first viewed the tragedy unfolding in New York and the Pentagon that the leadership of the Congress would take the unprecedented step to evacuate the Capitol complex. Sometime later that, we, later than that, we found out that passengers aboard United Airlines Flight 93 themselves learned of the heartbreaking events which occurred earlier that morning and, in a display of heroism beyond measure, would act to save who knows how many others by laying down their own lives. It's been suggested that while terrorists who struck the towers in New York were striking at the financial power of the United States, and those who flew into the Pentagon were striking at our Republic's military might, Flight 93 was intended to be a, a weapon used to strike at the most prominent symbol of the Founder's political genius, the United States Capitol. At the risk of sounding morbid, the People's House was saved by an act that would have caused Washington, Jefferson, Madison, and Hamilton to yield and salute. Those and all of the other icons of our political ancestry would have once again declared that all of the anxiety they endured, all of the genius they exhibited, all of the blood they and their fellow subjects turned citizens shed was worth it. Because at the end of the day, it was the people, not their government, that stood in the gap so that this great experiment in self-government would persevere. I bring to our remembrance the events of September 11, 2001, so that we put ourselves in the right frame of mind to understand the state of mind that the body politic of the United States, including their elected leaders, were in as we moved to other fateful decisions. Because we can't truly appreciate the genius of the Constitution's framers by armchair quarterbacking, 
or 17 years after the fact, 2020 hindsighting, the events of the period following the day that saw a greater loss of life on U.S. soil perpetrated by a foreign power than that which was occurred on December 7, 1941. No, we must repose on timeless principles infused in our foundational law. We need to know the state of mind of the body politic short after September 11, 2001 to understand the appeal that the discussion of the presence of a so-called axis of evil had. We all remember President Bush's 2002 State of the Union address. I know I do. Sitting in the House chamber listening to his presentation, the one th thing uh, I rem recall most is my confusion. Why are we talking about Iraq, Iran, North Korea, when we know for a fact where the planners of 9-11 are? Yes, those nations pose challenges to us, but those challenges couldn't compare to the murderous evil actually planned and coordinated from the failed state of Afghanistan. I ultimately concluded that I must have missed the point, including the axis in this speech. I thought the commander-in-chief would have concentrated on the events of and response to the most previous September 11th. The president had his reason. After all, it's his speech, according to Article 2, Section 3 of the Constitution. Obviously, not much will come from it. I was wrong. But I would soon learn that I wasn't the only one. When the entire administration began to beat the drums for war with Saddam Hussein, many of my House colleagues were caught off guard as well. Don't get me wrong, most of them would ultimately vote to grant President Bush the authority he desired to remove Saddam from power by force. But many of them, Republican members included, never seemed to feel comfortable with it, even up to the date of the actual vote. But once again, the executive branch, the article, but once again, the executive branch, the Article II branch of the federal government was of one voice. Yes, I know there was some early dissent, for example, from Secretary of State Colin Powell, but that dissent, at least publicly anyway, dissipated soon enough. The concept of speaking with one voice needs to be understood fully because without that understanding, the genius of the Constitution's framers may elude us. In this case, and others like it before and in the future, that genius is revealed as two sides of the same coin, or better said, a two-edged sword. You see, when the framers met in Philadelphia in that summer of 1787, one of the pressing issues was whether the general government would possess an executive council, as did a majority of the states at the time, or would they create a unitary federal executive? The Federalist paper writer Alexander Hamilton summarized the sentiment of he and fellow delegates when he observed, quote, These, those politicians and statesmen who have been the most celebrated for the soundness of their principles and for the justice of their views have declared in favor of a single executive, end quote. The framers well understood that one of the, if not the, most important function that the executive branch would carry out was the directing of the common defense against a foreign power. As such, Hamilton later focused his discussion on the importance of singularity in the executive branch when he declared this regarding the issue at hand today, quote, of all the cares or concerns of government, the direction of war most peculiarly demands the direction of war most uh, demands the, those qualities which distinguish the exercise of power by a single hand. The direction of war implies the direction of the common strength, and the power of directing and employing the common strength forms a usual and essential part in the definition of the executive authority." End quote. By, but in confiding the power to direct and employ the common strength in a single hand, the framers made the all-important correction to the function of government that had contributed so mightily to millennia of human suffering. Hamilton's fellow New Yorker and Federalist paper writer John Jay explained the impetus for the change when he reflected on human history and human nature and said, quote, monarchs will often make war when their nations are to get nothing by it, but for the purposes and object merely personal or private compacts to aggrandize or support their particular families or partisans. These and a variety of other motives, said, Jay said, which affect only the mind of the sovereign often lead him to engage in wars not sanctified by justice or the voice and interests of his people." End quote. It was Hamilton who described the convention's solution to this age-old dilemma when he contrasted the authority of the King of Great Britain and that of the President of the United States proposed in the Constitution. Quote, the President is to be Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States. In this respect, his authority would be nominally the same with that of the King of Great Britain, but in substance, much inferior to it. 
It would amount to nothing more than the supreme command and direction of the military and naval forces as first general and admiral of the Confederacy, while that of the British king extends to the declaring of war and to the raising and regulating of fleets and armies, all of which, by the Constitution under consideration, would appertain to the Congress. Federalist paper writer James Madison explained the work of the convention vis-a-vis -vis the war-making powers delegated to Congress, quote, the powers falling within the first class are those of declaring war and granting letters of mark, of providing armies and fleets, of regulating and calling forth the militia, of levying and borrowing money. Security against foreign danger is one of the primitive objects of civil society. It is an avowed and essential object of the American Union. The powers requisite for attaining it must be effectually confided to the federal councils, that is, the Congress, end quote. But lest we go too far in laying all the framers' concerns at the doorstep of the unitary executive, whose single hand in times before the formation of our Confederate Republic had directed nations, kingdoms, and empires into the dustbin of history by his unjust motives, we would do well to remind ourselves once again of the state of the collective mind of the body politic a year after the events which today we call into remembrance. A few weeks before the House and Senate voted to grant President George W. Bush the discretion to single-handedly take the Union to war in Iraq, a Pew Research report claimed 64% of Americans, quote, favor military action against Iraq, end quote. I recall a wonk once saying, find an 80% issue and stand next to it. While 64% is not 80%, if my math still serves me, uh, it is 80% of 80%. In other words, I can tell you that many of my colleagues in the House at the time were hearing from many of their constituents demanding that they do one thing, support the President's effort to oust Saddam. And they weren't just hearing from their constituents, Influential Americans all over the country were expressing the same sentiment. In fact, shortly before the Congress would vote on the Iraq War Resolution, prominent evangelical Christian leaders signed on to what's been dubbed the Land Letter. Authored by Dr. Richard Land, then president of the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention, the letter articulated the signatory's support for President Bush's desire of regime change in Iraq. The letter addressed to President Bush contained the following, quote, we believe that your stated policies concerning Saddam Hussein and his headlong pursuit and development of biochemical and nuclear weapons of mass destruction are prudent and fall well within the time-honored criteria of just war theory as developed by Christian theologians in the late fourth and early fifth centuries AD. We believe that the cost of not dealing with this threat now will only succeed in greatly increasing the cost in human lives and suffering when an even more heavily armed and dangerous Saddam Hussein must be confronted at some date in the not too distant future. We believe that every day of delay significantly increases the risk of far greater human suffering in the future than actually now would entail. We are extremely grateful that we have a president who has learned the costly lessons of the 20th century, it went on to say, and who is determined to lead America and the world to a far different and better future in the 21st century. As you to told the world leaders at the UN, Mr. President, we make the stand with you. In so doing, while we cannot speak for all of our constituents, we are su supremely confident that we are voicing the convictions and concerns of the great preponderance of those we are privileged to serve." End quote. I would point out that Dr. Land's letter reveals a reality observed by Pennsylvania delegate to the Constitutional Convention, Dr. Benjamin Franklin. Dr. Franklin stated from the floor of the convention, quote, there is a natural inclination to man in mankind to kingly government, end quote. Dr. Land's letter reflected that natural inclination in that it was addressed to the President of the United States and not to the Congress in whom, Madison posited, the powers requisite for attaining security against foreign danger are effectually confided. While Dr. Land was correct about the great preponderance of evangelical Christian support for regime change in Iraq, the Pew Report re informed those of us in Congress that the preponderance of support for expelling Saddam Hussein from power was not limited to the pews of America's evangelical churches. But all that said, was there anything that could have saved us from what President Reagan's NSA director, Lieutenant General William Odom, called 
the greatest strategic disaster in our country? More importantly for us going forward, is there anything that could spare us and the world a repeat of such a calamity? And even more specifically to our point here today, did the Constitution's framers foresee the possibility of such a catastrophe and equip the federal government with the requisite check? Yes, they did. In describing the peculiar Constitution of the Senate as originally established, Alexander Hamilton explained the necessity for such a check. Quote, there are particular moments in public affairs when the people, stimulated by some irregular passion or some illicit advantage, or misled by the artful misrepresentations of interested men, may call for measures which they themselves will afterwards be the most ready to lament and condemn. In these critical moments, how salutary will be the interference of some temperate and respectable body of citizens in order to check the misguided career and to suspend the blow meditated by the people against themselves until reason justice and truth can regain their authority over the public mind. What bitter anguish would not the people of Athens have often escaped if their government had contained so provident a safeguard against the tyranny of their own passions, he went on to say. Popular liberty might then have escaped the indelible reproach of decreeing to the same citizens the hemlock on one day and statues on the next, end quote. I'll never forget attending an event back in Indiana a couple of days after I voted against President Bush's wishes regarding the Iraq War Resolution. It was less than a month before the November election and given the looks I received from a couple of Republican candidates for local office who were attending the event, I would have preferred hemlock to what they no doubt imagined for me. <laughs> On the other hand, I'm not expecting any statues either. Let me just interject at this point and suggest to you that while Hamilton was talking about the Senate, nothing in, this, in the Constitution precludes House members from similarly interfering at such particular moments in public affairs. The solution we seek has always been there. As Americans, we must resist human nature and require of our members of Congress that they take seriously their obligation to interfere against that future misguided career and, when necessary, suspend the blow meditated by we, the people, against ourselves, so that later, when reason, justice, and truth regain their authority over our collective mind, we will not lament and condemn the measures we, the people, ourselves called for earlier. Not long after I left Congress, I was listening to a local Christian radio station back home again in Indiana. The speaker was informing the listening public about the persecution of the church in Iraq. There was almost a despondent tone in his voice. It was odd to hear him that way because I'd often and for a long time heard this particular speaker's strong, positive defense of the gospel than I remembered. He was one of the signatories of the land letter. It wasn't a despondent tone that I heard. It was the sound of lament. Can I tell you today that I was considering the fate of the Assyrian and Chaldean churches in Iraq or what would happen to Saddam Hussein's Catholic spokesman Tariq Aziz under the rule of a Shia majority when I voted against the October 2002 authorization of the use of military force against Iraq? I could, but I've been out of office so long that I don't think uh, I could pull something like that off. Um, what I can tell you without hesitation is that the Constitution's framers knew that such future events would shake this Confederate Republic to the core. Some would argue that the political well-being of our Union takes preeminence when weighed against the liberty experienced by some religious minority and a potential or current enemy. I would wholeheartedly agree. However, one of the many important lessons we've learned from Iraq is that the two aren't always mutually exclusive. Once again, the framers' genius reveals itself. Knowing this and knowing the fallen nature of man, they devised a plan of the con convention, as they called it, which would shield their posterity from the mis misdirected passion of both the masses and their perceived monarch. But if we don't support and admonish Congress, uh, don't admonish Congress, the fault lies not with the framers' plan, but with we, the people. Thank you very much. <laughs>